Welcome back to our show, uh, Dave McManaman of ESPN. How are you, Dave? I'm doing fantastic. Good to talk to you, Rich. Yeah, you bet. It, it, I have not uh, read your tome yet. In, in there, uh, is there any part about being defollowed by uh, by LeBron James on Twitter? <laughs> has there been any part of this book about that, Dave? Oh, back to our humble beginnings. Yeah, well, it, there was a reference to that odd march that LeBron went through on social media, uh, and I think we put it to some uh, some degree. He defollowed, so unfollowed some basketball luminaries who might have throw myself a bone that way or something along uh, along those lines. But uh, I don't, my name is on the cover. But I don't, it doesn't make it to the copy. Well, as you know, national media um, has been wringing its hands over the Cavs um, since the turn of the calendar year, pretty much. Um, are, are they still a team that's trying to find a light switch, do you think, Dave? Well, the tough part is we're trying to judge this team based on everything else we've ever seen in the NBA. And that is what anyone would do you try to have an informed opinion based on past experiences but they're not like other teams their best player has been managing himself during the regular season to try to gear up for a seventh consecutive trip to the nba finals i'll say that again a seventh consecutive trip to the nba finals which is a two-month playoff process uh of course he was going to be a different player in the playoffs versus a regular season and then you add in the fact they have the oldest roster of any of the 16 teams in the playoffs so that was a factor as well they were trying to manage the entire roster and they had health concerns and they had players in and out in terms of 22 different guys on wearing a Cavs uniform at some point this season so now that you you take away the fact that LeBron's not trying to rest anymore you take away the fact that there's no back-to-back or four and five situations during the playoffs so theoretically they're going to have more energy night to night and you throw in the fact that all those guys are healthy, they're going to be a different team, and they've started to show some signs of being that different team. Cavs and NBA writer for ESPN.com, Dave McManaman here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, awkward for Paul George, or is this something that is uh, something that he's been wanting to say and, and it's time for him to uh, voice his opinion about his teammates with potentially the end being nigh for him in Indiana? It's such a thin line between being a guy who is beneficial to your teammates by telling them what they need to hear and getting the most out of them to just being a guy that no one wants to be around because where is that negativity going to help us in a situation we're already down 2-0? Uh, I, I, I don't think the comments about Lance Stevenson and Miles Turner after game two were that egregious, but it, like you don't see – that type of thing that often, a guy calling out a teammate in a press conference that everyone's going to see across the league. The problem I had was game one, even more so. C.J. Miles had a great look to win that game in an arena where it used to be his home uh, gym. He played for the Cavs, and he would always kill the Cavs. If your teammate gets that type of look to win the game, you should be trying to breed confidence in him, not criticize him publicly for saying, i got to have that shot. I mean, Michael Jordan set up Steve Kerr in a final game to win the game. Uh, he should think about that, then, then think that he always needs to have the ball in his hands in that situation. Uh, because really, I mean, if you, just, if you know basketball, a good shot's a good shot, especially for a guy like C.J. Miles, who's a very proficient jump shot shooter. And, and one more question for you here, Dave, as we, we get you set for the rest of the, the playoffs, and we'll have you back on as we assume the Cavs will matriculate their way towards the conference finals at the very least, is what is the process about the resting that went down? Is it LeBron saying, I need these days? Is it somebody in the front office who's got the slide rule and the metrics and the and the analytics out? Is it Tyron Lu? What is the process of that the Cavs went through deciding when LeBron and Kyrie and Love were resting and why? Literally the day the schedule for 2016-2017 came out this past summer, I think it was late July or early August, the Cavs front office, David Griffin, the manager, general manager, got together with Tyron Lu and they went through schedule and they, at that moment, circle of days where they think they thought it would be beneficial for LeBron to rest. And they went into the season with that as their tentative plan. And basically the idea was one out of every 10 games, we're going to give him a game off. And 
Now, things were adjusted slightly as the season went on, but they came out of it with pretty much their exact plan. Le- LeBron rested eight games out of 82. That's one out of every 10. They stuck to their guns, and again, the, he's not your average player. He's not, he has not been through the amount of workload that pretty much any of his peers have been through over the last six seasons. And it became such an issue because there was national TV games and other teams were resting stars as well. But uh, they don't really feel deterred because it, it was funny the way it was latched onto the media. Like it was this brand new revelation. Oh my gosh, guys are resting. It's been going on for a decade with the San Antonio Spurs, and they won because of it, or it certainly aided in their pursuit of championships. And so the, the Cavs, until Adam Silver, you know, drives up to the arena and pulls LeBron off the bench and throws him on the court, they're going to continue to manage rest the way they had this season as they move forward but why you know on the road all at once and 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 yes I I would agree that because it's LeBron it's treated differently because he is LeBron because he is the most famous NBA player world worldwide there's no question about it and he's absurdly popular and people want to see him so basically you're saying when the schedule came out Clipper fans were screwed essentially uh, to, to some extent. Now, uh, that Clippers game was also affected by Kyrie Irving coming out of the last game with knee tightness and Kevin Love being one game removed from missing a month for knee surgery. Mm-hmm. So if those two guys weren't going to go, the decision was why, when LeBron was, you know, already could use some rest as we near the playoffs, why play him and put more burden on him without having his teammates out there? Uh, when it could very well be a, be a loss anyway and potentially risk injury. And that's the way they think of things. And I understand how fans want to see him wherever he goes, but I think real basketball fans want to see him playing at his best in the NBA Finals, right? Like, isn't that what you're really going to remember, him playing the Warriors when you tune in on ABC versus you going to, you know, a, a March or February game? No, I, I really know. mean anything? I understand, Dave, but if I, you know, I, if, I've got, uh, if I've got a ticket plan and they're going to charge me more because it's the one time LeBron comes into town and LeBron comes into town and I bring my children and he's sitting, I'm pissed. And I'm not going to be thinking about the NBA Finals and how rested he is. It's kind of just that simple. Yeah, but I mean, you guys know? don't play 82 out of 82. If that's, Unless that's you're Russell game. Westbrook or James Harden. I mean, look, you're well, right. You're right. And, and those guys. No, and those guys have not been back to, to the final six straight years, and they haven't been on the national landscape since they were in high school either. I, I understand. He's, he's just a different case. And I'm not denying it. I'm absolutely not right. denying it. But I, I'm empathetic to the fans. I mean, I was, you know, uh, five kids on a one uh, parent income growing up, and my dad would scrounge up money to try to get us tickets. And, you know, we, we saw one of Michael Jack. Jordan's last games in Philadelphia as a Chicago Bowl. If he didn't play that game, man, I would have been. You've been heartbroken. Hey, yeah, D- Dave, con- congrats on your book with uh, Brian Winhorst. Uh, get it at Cavs2016book.com or at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Look forward to having you back on during the playoffs. Appreciate it, Rich. You got it. That's Dave McManaman, Return of the King, LeBron James, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the greatest comeback in history. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.